Hey, hi everyone, and welcome to the Autism Understanding Scotland's webinar um, on an intro to autism. Um, so we tried to make this a really uh, very basic, as, as, like a, a, an introduction to autism. So it's a wee bit different to a lot of the other webinars that we've run, but we're quite excited to um, to, to, to dive into this today. Uh, anytime I attend an event like this, I always want to know who are these people and why should I be listening to them? Uh, so my name is Marion McLaughlin. I'm the CEO at Autism Understanding Scotland. My background before I started working in the third sector was largely as um, a primary school teacher, although it was quite varied, lots of different jobs where I was working with autistic people pretty much every time. I'm one of the spokespersons for the Scottish Government's Different Minds campaign. And if anybody hasn't checked it out yet, then we strongly recommend you have a little look at the new um, the new face of the campaign that's come out and not just because they animated me in it. And I'm absolutely adorable in two dimensions. Uh, as well as being late diagnosed autistic myself, I'm also the parent of an autistic child. Who are you, Flick? I am Felicity or Flick Goodhall. Um, I'm the senior autism practitioner at AU Scott here. I am also the parent of Two autistic kids as well, um, late diagnosed myself. Uh, it uh, must be about two years since I got my diagnosis now. Um, I keep meaning to go and check the date so I know when to celebrate, but uh, yeah, <laughs> executive functioning means we, we I don't. We need to celebrate that. I do, do. Um, I'm a former English tutor um, and also uh, I was really heavily involved with the Aberdeenshire Autism Strategy. I was one of the co-chairs um, on the planning group um, and facilitated some of the working groups for that. And it's about to all come out very soon, which is very exciting. So when we talk about autism and being autistic, we come from the um, experience of being autistic ourselves of being parents of autistic people and professionals who support autistic people. So any way around that table, we've pretty much that, haven't we, Flick? Absolutely, yeah, it gives us lots of perspectives. Um, and in true educator fashion, we like to sort of set out some intentions today. So we're going to do some discussion around what autism is, what it actually is. Uh, we're going to do some myth busting, um, because we know that there's a lot of myths out there about autism. So we usually have a little bit of a giggle whenever we look at some of those, but some of them are quite serious too. And we're going to have a look at the language to describe autistic people, the autistic community, um, uh, language to describe autism, because we know that that's something that a lot of people worry about getting right, don't they, Flip? Yeah, yeah, I know that it, it can be quite anxiety inducing for a lot of people if they're not quite sure if that, you know, what, what the up to date kind of guidance is and things. So we like to, yeah, cover that in, in a, a good amount of detail, I'd say, as well. So let's sort of do a little bit to start. What, what autism actually is, I mean, whenever we talk about what is autism really, autistic people have differently structured brains. We generally have differently structured brains. And there's a lot of research that's sort of, you know, gone around in this area and a lot of it is really evolving. So what we're sharing is what we kind of got as some of the most up-to-date information that, that, that we've got. Um, but we tend to have differences in our synaptic pathways. And this beautiful picture that we've got here looks at an example of yeah, an autistic brain versus a non-autistic brain. And this is the synaptic pathways in those. Around about the end of the second trimester, the beginning of the third trimester, all brains, autistic or not, create these really well-developed synaptic pathways. And these are really important because information jumps, um, goes into the brain to be processed by the neurons and it jumps from one neuron to another and it's got to jump across the synaptic gap to do so. Um, and in most uh, non-autistic people, what tends to happen is that the brain gets out the gardening shears and it says, do you know what? We don't need this pathway, so we'll prune that one. We don't need that pathway, we'll prune that one. Let's go to that pathway, we'll prune that one too. And it becomes a bit more streamlined. Whereas mm, autistic brains don't undergo that natural pruning process to, to the same extent, which means that we have these really quite highly developed um, synaptic pathways instead, which means that it's easier for our brains to then keep on processing that information between neurons and sort of swapping that information, which um, means that might have an impact on how we experience our sensory processing, on 
um, how we're interpreting the world around us, how we're interacting. We're going to have a little look at kind of what it means to be autistic um, just, in a, just in a wee minute as well. Some, there's some evidence that there might be different number of neurons in different parts of the brain for some autistic people, but that's not uniform, is it? So that my brain is going to have maybe more neurons or fewer neurons in some parts, which are not going to be the same as your split. So. No, no, and they won't be the same as Anne's or our colleagues. They won't be the same as any other autistic persons at all. So we not only have brains that really differ from what, what would be considered a typical brain, but we differ quite a lot from each other as well. You know, we've got these similarities, but each of our brains is going to be significantly kind of different to, to other people's. We also have differences in the different um, areas of the size of the different areas of the brains too. So for some autistic people, for example, the amygdala might be smaller than you might typically expect or larger. And we know that trauma can have an impact on this. And most of the autistic people that we support have got a trauma background as well. It's really common within the autistic community. So it's not a surprise that that happened. There is some evidence that autistic brains tend to be more symmetrical the non-autistic brains and as far as I can tell we don't really know what that means but it's kind of cool I guess I feel like a little bit of symmetry um there's evidence that we might be more likely to use both sides of our brains at the same time as well and we do tend to find that some autistic people might have very logical responses to something that other people might see as emotional but also very emotional responses to something that some other people might see as, as quite logical as well so that can have, again, more of an impact on how we're processing the world around us and how other people react to us as well. Um, and we can also have some more unique connections in our brains as well. So there's going to be parts of my brain that's connected up to other parts of the brain that you wouldn't find in a typically developed brain. Um, and that's not going to match yours either, Flip. No, no, they're all going to be very yeah. different again. Yeah. Um, is there anything I could have missed there? Like, no, anything no, you would covered all of that? Fab. Okay, let's have a look. There's a couple of different theories about autism. There's quite a lot of theories about autism and fairness, right? Yeah, there are loads out there, but um, a, a lot of them were kind of developed some time ago. A lot of them we we've discovered since then that they're really not very accurate. Actually, um, some of them are quite stigmatizing and, and kind of problematic as well so we picked out a couple that we feel that the autistic community you know a lot of us in the autistic community actually do see a lot of merit in um see ourselves in which is you know really important and where there, there actually is some evidence to back up <laughs> those those theories um and it fits in really nicely with that last slide and and kind of thinking about those brains and those brain differences because you know the the hyper connected brain um or you know us having that hyper connectivity is very much linked to those synaptic pathways that Marion was talking about the fact that we don't go through that pruning process so we have more of those synaptic pathways they are longer and they connect parts of the brain together that you just don't see in other brains so that we're hyper connected um you know we, we really do kind of we're literally able to make those connections other people can't because we literally have bits of our brains connected that you just wouldn't wouldn't see in other people would you and i do wonder if that's part of the reason why so many autistic people are such good out the box thinkers you know because we can just make those connections that that seem very elegant and quite obvious to a lot of us that sometimes some other people miss yeah, absolutely. We can we can really kind of come up with creative solutions a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah, we, we've got that hyper connectivity. Um, and then the other one is monotropism, um, which is uh, if, if anybody's heard of um, being sort of hyper fixated or hyper focused, um, you know, that's that's all connected to that. So that's the idea that when we are really focused on something, we're focused on it to the exclusion of all else. And we are, can really deep dive into that thing, whatever it is, whether that's a, a topic that we're researching, whether it's an activity that we're engaging in, we really, really do just focus in on it. Um, and that can come with some real benefits. It, it might have some drawbacks as well, but you know, um, so on, on the plus side, that means that we can really go into great depth 
with things, um, which can have amazing uh, consequences when it comes to all sorts of areas of our lives, you know, work and education and things, but also just our own joy and our own pleasure and kind of managing to really focus in on something. It does on the flip side um, mean that our, our executive functioning, our, our ability to kind of maybe think about all the different things that we need to do and start them and, and, you know, do them in the right order and finish them, that might be a bit affected because if you're just really hyper-focused on one thing that you're doing, that means that you might not remember that actually the tea's in the oven at the moment and, you know, you should have gone and checked on that or that you were supposed to, you decided that you were going to clean the bathroom that day or whatever else it is that you've got going on and you might, you know, not notice that you need the toilet or things like that. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's a... Uh, I think it's one that we feel um, does reflect our lived experience anyway, um, doesn't it? Absolutely. And it's for anyone who wants to learn more, um, our friend Fergus Murray from Amaze has created a really fantastic website all about monotropism, which is well worth checking out. Um, uh, Fergus is the child of uh, the wonderful late Dinah Murray, who um, uh, sort, of, sort of posited the theory of monotropism. And absolutely worth checking out that work is really really valuable and I so relate to that you know whenever I'm doing something like playing a video game or really absorbed in a book it really does feel like the rest of the world completely melts away and it's just me and the thing whatever the thing is and it is so joyful whatever you can do that at times I really I love that aspect of being autistic um but yeah what else does it mean to be autistic then um so because it can mean sort of different things practically. So what does it mean sort of, you know, in practice to be autistic? So it does mean that we can process information differently. Um, and it, it, because we've got those different connections that are, that are going on, that we communicate differently. And if anybody didn't check out the last webinar that we did last month with the fabulous Sophia from um, Scottish Ethnic Minority Autistics, it is up on our YouTube page and it's well worth having a look at um, because we do communicate in a fundamentally different way. We might use the same spoken language, but the way that we use language is, is, is significantly different. We can also have sensory differences as well, which can be sort of related to that ability to keep on passing information around and around and around and around. We're not going to go into great detail in sensory differences today, but one of the things that I did recently at a training event was um, I tried to illustrate it by shaking our lovely colleague Julie's hand. Um, and I asked Julie, uh, tell me when you stop feeling my hands. And she stopped feeling it pretty much straight away. But I kept on experiencing that sensation that I was holding her hand for about half an hour, 45 minutes afterwards, because my brain was still processing that. That experience of touch, which given how fond I am of Julie was quite nice. So that can be a really lovely experience to have at times. We can also have a very dynamic skill set, right? And what does that mean? So the dynamic skill set can mean that you can do all the things one day. So you might be really, really organized that, you know, going and um, killing it at work, getting all your bills paid, um, cooking yourself a beautiful dinner from scratch, uh, going up straight, doing all the things on one day, but then maybe the next day find it really difficult to do any of the things. Um, so it can be a lot harder to do that. Whereas a lot of non-autistic people, what they can do one day to after the next might be really, really similar. But for autistic folks, it can very, very, very much vary on lots of different things, which we're going to be talking about. We tend to find as well that, you know, autistic people can have a spiky skill set as well. So what that kind of means is that we might really excel in some areas, but find some other areas really, really difficult. Um, so that's why we might, for example, see some people who are lawyers um, who, you know, managed to pass all their exams and be really successful, but find it difficult to tie shoelaces or read an analog clock. Totally fine, by the way, because you don't need to tie shoelaces or read analog clocks if you don't want to. Absolutely fine. Um, and an example for myself, when I was in primary one, my um, my report card showed I got A's and B's for everything 
except for art, where I got a D for art. And, you know, I said, like, thank you, Mrs. Jameson, for giving me a D in art. Um, but she was she was right in the sense that my my um, fine motor skills were not as well developed as a lot of the other kids, which is totally cool. By the time I got to primary six, I came third in a local art contest. And I tell you, having had a D for art in primary one, I really enjoyed that third place prize for sure. That that meant the world to me. Um, and we might also have different levels of focus and interest. So we might, as we said on the last slide, we might really be able to focus in on things in a way that a lot of other people might really struggle to do. You know, that really lovely flow state where, you know, you're managing to get everything done. So a lot of autistic, not all, but a lot of autistic people find it really easy to get into that flow state. And the level of interest that we have, I mean, flip, special interest. They're just oh. one of the most beautiful aspects of being autistic, aren't they? Absolutely. They're protective to our mental health. They're just really amazing to kind of deep dive into. Um, and yeah, you know, we do find that sometimes uh, professionals and, and maybe family members might get a bit concerned about us having special interests, you know, oh, they're very, very focused on that one thing. Should they not broaden out their interests? Um, but yeah, actually having those those special interests is a big part of being autistic and it is really good for us um, and it, it can really help with things like autistic burnout and stuff as well. So, yeah, that's mm. a fab, fab part of being autistic. <laughs> really is. And just what a difference it can make to us when that is the case. Um, all right. How about, shall we talk about this one together? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So this is a yeah. big one, isn't it? And it, it's so difficult to get up to date, accurate stats. Um, on a lot of these things because um, the research is always kind of evolving unfortunately a lot of the research done into autism isn't in the areas that autistic people would actually like it to be you know that the focus is often just why are there autistic people why do they exist in the first place uh, which we will get to um but yeah we, <laughs> we the the research isn't there for an awful lot of other areas and a lot of the time the kind of numbers and things aren't recorded anywhere so we're going to kind of talk about some of the most up-to-date figures that we've we've heard recently um, um, but this is constantly kind of evolving and changing as we discover more and more, isn't it? Yeah, so this isn't, you know, like uh, the absolute truth. Um, and I'm quite well aware that uh, in six months time, some of, some of this might be well out of date, couldn't it? Oh, yeah. The, mo the most up to date recent statistic that we have for Scotland says that around about one in 100 people are autistic. But we know that it's likely to be a lot higher. Some of the stats that we've seen in the States, it's closer to what, 1 in 35. But that report from Northern Ireland, was it just um, earlier on this week, last week, saying 1 in 20 pupils in the schools are autistic? That's a significant jump, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, we, we are very much of the view that actually that one in 100 is is very low. Um, so likely, as we discover more that you're going to see that figure rise. And that doesn't mean that suddenly there are more autistic people who exist in the world. It's because we're much better at recognizing the autistic people in the world, actually. Yeah. Um, some of the diagnosticians are reporting even numbers of men and women and a growing number of trans um, people as well. We used to sort of believe that autism was something that only boys experienced, you know, only boys could be autistic. And um, when I was doing my teacher training 18, 19 years ago, it was very much for um, only one in every 20 autistic people were girls. That, 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 that was roughly the stats that I was told back then. Um, but we are seeing some diagnosticians who are um, assessing uh, adults are actually assessing more women than, and, 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 and diagnosing more women than men. Now, is that because more women are happy to put themselves forward for, for assessment? You know, um, what's the stats around who's actually putting themselves forward for it? You know, that, that doesn't mean to say that there are more autistic women than autistic men or there's more autistic men than autistic women. We just don't know. Um, and a lot of it is just around who puts themselves forward for assessment. So, it's a real it's an interesting area that we're very much keeping an eye on but yeah. from what we can gather you're no more likely to be autistic if you're a man or a woman or non-binary yeah. really 
it was the case historically that sort of um, white cis middle class boys were the ones who were studied, you know, those those autistic boys were the ones that were actually looked at. And so it makes sense that we would then be better at diagnosing them because, you know, that that kind of presentation, the way that they've been socialized, that's the way that was actually accepted as being autistic in the first place. But now that we're actually seeing studies being done into a wider group of people who are autistic, then we're actually seeing those people being diagnosed more as well because we're we're able to recognize that and it, it really is kind of that that simple rather than there being some sort of yeah clear cut like oh if you're in this group you're so much more likely to be autistic <laughs> and I think a lot of people do kind of try to gender autism and say well autistic girls mask more so that's why you don't but as an organization we see a lot of autistic men who mask a tremendous amount a lot of autistic boys who mask a tremendous amount a lot of autistic um, non-binary people who mask a tremendous amount as well. We also see a lot of women and non-binary people who don't mask quite to the same extent as well for various different reasons. So there's no male autism or female autism. It's A lot of it is due to the different presentations can be due to how we're socialised. It could be due to cultural differences. It could be due to family expectations. There's lots of different reasons why different autistic people present in different ways and there are as many different brands or types of autism as there are autistic people right absolutely yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um trans people are three to six times more likely to identify as autistic and there's some really strong links um between the autistic community and the lgbt plus community um, an awful lot of the autistic-led organisations are run by people who are also part of the LGBT plus community. Not everybody who is autistic is part of that community, but we do find a big strong crossover between between um, the autistic community and the LGBT plus community. Is that fair to say? Yeah, no, I think that that's, mm -hmm. that's something that we see a lot, you know, in, in the work we do as well and, and in the people that we support. Um, but yeah, there's also historically there's been this massive conflation of pe autistic people and people who have a learning disability as well um but yeah what what we do know is kind of back in in 2019 there was a study done um that found that interestingly 30 percent um of autistic adults had a learning disability and 15% of autistic children had a learning disability. And, you know, you might be sort of thinking to yourselves, hang on a moment, <laughs> those numbers that don't add up. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. So when you hit 18 you, and you're autistic, you suddenly really likely to develop a learning disability. Like, no, that's, that's not what's going on there. Um, what that does show uh, is that probably historically, you are more likely to get that that diagnosis of being autistic if you had a learning disability and those people have now become adults and that we're, we're maybe quite good at spotting autistic people um, as adults who have a learning disability um, but we're getting better and better at spotting you know kids um, who are autistic who don't have a learning disability um, and again it's one of those numbers where each time um, research kind of comes out each time a new study comes out that number is going, going down and, and down and down. Um, and what we're kind of expecting to see in the future is that probably being autistic means you're no more or less likely than anybody else to, to have a learning disability. Um, and it has been a problem to have those two things conflated for us, for autistic people, but also for the learning disability community. Um, both groups have been quite vocal on on how harmful that has been for us because actually we don't have a lot of the same needs so lumping us all in together like that it, it doesn't really help either group um and and yeah there's been a, a lot of ways in which they've been conflated together hasn't there yeah absolutely and you know we've seen sort of you know recent campaigns in scotland where also some learning disability have been conflated um which has been really, really problematic for for a whole number of um, reasons. Uh, and it's something that, yeah, I think disabled persons organisations really want to be seen as, you know, who we are. And I really want to stress that there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a learning disability. Absolutely nothing wrong. And every individual, every single human being has innate value for, for, for who they are. But when we see people who have a learning disability treated as if they're not autistic, when they're not, that's not helpful for them. And when we see autistic people who treat as if they have a learning disability, when they're not, it's not helpful for them either. 
So I think that conflation is something that both communities are trying quite hard to see um, to, 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 to get that removed. Um, but given that so many autistic people, so many areas in, in Scotland for quite a long time only assessed you as an adult, if you had a learning disability, it's understandable why that conflation is there. But yeah. we are seeing that being challenged more and more, which is really good. We do, however, have quite a significant proportion of autistic people are also ADHD as well. Um, and we tried to find some statistics on that. And the, some of the studies that we found, they varied from what, 40 to 80 percent? Yeah. So really quite high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's again, it's one of those ones, you know, depending on where you look, you do get different figures. But certainly it's something that in the work that we do, we come across a lot of autistic people who are also ADHD as well. So we do see that that big crossover, that Venn diagram would have a really yeah. big chunk in the middle. <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. So these are, as we said, they're just the most up-to-date stats that we've been able to get. But we do also understand that some of these might change and they, 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 they might develop as our understanding and as um, studies into uh, the autistic community develop and actually include more autistic people's um, input into what is that's being studied and when. Uh, shall we move on to the next? I think it's your favourite one. Oh, yes. So what does cause autism? I promised that we would go into that and I love yelling out in the middle of a webinar, sex! <laughs> because actually, yeah, autistic people having sex and that's what causes more autistic people an awful lot of the time. And again, this is something where we, we've we tried to find, you know, the, the really precise stats on this um, and, and we did more research again. It's what an area that we're always really interested in and we're always kind of looking at, but before when we were actually preparing this webinar, we had another look for it and oh, the stats are very wildly, um, you know, that sort of a bit, a bit on the lower side, kind of the kind of 50% or whatever, but one was going right up to 95 point something percent. Um, so yeah, if you are, have an autistic family member, a close autistic family member, you know, likely a parent, but maybe a, a grandparent, a sibling, then you are, roughly and like I said it's it's hard to pin down this stat and this is likely to change 80 percent likely to to be autistic yourself so it is that really strong strong genetic component that that comes in um, and again in terms of the the service users that we support at the charity you know we so often do see that that being the case um, it's something that for our own lived experience that very much rings true. Um, so, you know, 20 percent or less, or, you know, a bit more <laughs> um, of autistic people might not have that that autistic family member. Um, but, you know, whether or not that was just the case that when the study was done, they didn't realize, you know, they didn't realize that they were autistic. Um, we're, we're not kind of sure. And to be honest, a lot of autistic people don't really care. We're not fussed about why we're here, you know, because we're here um, and there's nothing wrong with being autistic. Our focus is actually having a good quality of life. Um, and what we would really love to see at the charity is less research done into what causes autism and more research done into how autistic people can be better supported. Mm -hmm. That's fair to say, Mary. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think for 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 some families, you're you're faster counting the number of people who are not autistic in a family, and very very often whenever we're you know supporting people or we're out doing training, we'll have someone who you know, comes up to us and say, "I have an autistic child," or "I have an autistic sibling," and then by the end of the session or by the end of the the um, one one appointment, they might then be saying, "I think I've got a few more questions about myself now." <laughs> Can we make another appointment to sort of discuss whether or not I might be autistic too? And that's that's totally cool. And I think for a lot of families, whenever they realise that they have multiple autistic family members, the amount of peer support that you can get within the within the family home, within you know, within the wider family, can be really lovely and it can be very, very reassuring, I think, for autistic kids to know that they've got an autistic sibling, an autistic parent, an autistic grandparent. So it, it can be a, a, a lovely, a beautiful thing to share because then you can also share those strategies for how you've supported yourself, you know, and you can validate all those experiences too. It can be a great thing. It really can. 
All right. So this one was a really fun one to put together. What's been blamed for the rise of autism? So there's a lot of studies that go out there and say, why are there more autistic people out there? You know, what is causing autism? So um, vaccines, we know, has been one. And even though that original study that blamed vaccines for the rise, of, you know, for, 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 for why we have autistic people, has been debunked time and time and time and time again, we still do have people asking us on occasions, do vaccines cause autism? We know a lot of families still, whenever they're disclosing that their child is autistic to someone, they'll also say, do you think it's because they were vaccinated? And there's absolutely no evidence that that is the case. Um, I know Chicken Nuggets and Peppa Pig, I mean, we, we shared a slide like this recently to our friends at Homestar. And as soon as they saw um, Peppa Pig, they all started giggling. But there was a, a, a report that came out in the States blaming Peppa Pig for a rise in the number of autistic children. Um, uh, and one of our lovely service users, a friend, a friend of the AU Scott, told us that they were reading um, a report that said chicken nuggets caused autism. Then they read another report saying that chicken nuggets cured autism while their child was eating chicken nuggets and watching Peppa Pig at the same time. And just thought, well, kiddo, you're just no more or less autistic than you were before we started this dinner and watching Peppa Pig. It's just they don't they they don't have that allergies. I mean, a lot of autistic people have allergies, right? Yeah, yeah. It that you know it is one of those commonly co-occurring things for us. Um, but there's absolutely no reason to think that allergies themselves cause autism, especially because we know from that that slide that we had on on the brain that you become autistic before you're born. So before you've developed any allergies, you are already autistic. So yeah, no, that's it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Neither does poor parenting. And I think there was for a long time there was that theory of the refrigerator mother. Your mother didn't love you enough, so that's why you're autistic. That's well been debunked. Um, and we, we know that that's still uh, a theory that still goes around in some countries around the world. But poor parenting, refrigerator mothering, nothing to do with whether or not you're autistic, is it? No, absolutely not. And, you know, it might be that we have a slightly different parenting style if we are also autistic as a parent. But that doesn't mean that somehow the way that we parented caused our child to be autistic in any way. Mm -hmm. And neither does bad nutrition, does it? You know, and I think that this is probably linked in that and the chicken nuggets one. You know, some autistic people due to the, the sensory differences that we have. Um, it might be that we have a restricted diet. We might have, as, as a lovely service user coined for us, um, a vegetarian diet. So we might be a bit more likely to eat some of the, that kind of processed beige looking food often because it tastes really consistent we know exactly what to expect in terms of texture in terms of flavor every time we eat it but that does not mean that poor nutrition in any way actually causes autism yeah <laughs> and yeah it kind of goes along with pepper pig doesn't it yeah yeah mm -hmm. absolutely yeah there's nothing that you can watch on tv that's going to make you autistic that's just not going to happen um and TikTok doesn't either, does it? I think I think that's because, you know, for some people, they've maybe been on something like TikTok or other social media, and they've seen somebody autistic talking about their lived experience, you know, and they've thought, oh, actually, I see a lot of that in myself. I, you know, I'm recognizing this. I'm, I'm really relating to this. And then they've gone and started saying to people, you know, I think I, I might be autistic because I, I saw that thing on TikTok, but it wasn't watching the TikTok video that caused them to be autistic it was maybe just watching that tiktok video that made them realize that they were autistic <laughs> absolutely um yeah the not breastfeeding had been linked to a rise in autism in, in one study as well um now it is possible that some autistic children may be less likely to be breastfed but we would posit that that's potentially because some autistic people are parents of the the autistic baby and might really struggle to breastfeed for a number of different reasons. You know, sensory-wise, breastfeeding is really, really quite intense. Um, and that might just be a little bit too much. Um, it might be because, um, the you know, that feeling of, you know, the, the touch all the time might be really intense for them as well. So there's lots of different reasons why some autistic children might be a bit less likely to be breastfed than others. But there's also an awful lot of autistic parents out there 
who are really keen on breastfeeding and also breastfeed a huge amount as well, which is absolutely brilliant. And yet we would point out not every non-autistic child gets breastfed either. And how you feed your baby, no bearing at all on whether or not they're going to be autistic because they were autistic before they were born. Yeah, I was breastfed and I'm still autistic. So, yeah, that didn't stop me from being autistic at all. Um, no. C-sections also, it's another one, isn't it? Where <laughs> There was um, a hospital in uh, Australia last year, I think earlier this year or last year, who put up an article on their website saying that C-sections were, 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 were a factor in whether or not a child was likely to be autistic. And it, again, absolutely no bearing. And there might be some reasons why some autistic people might be more likely to have C-sections. Again, there might be a lot of anxiety around um, giving birth in other ways that, you know, it's possible because of different presentations of pain, all sorts of different kinds of reasons why some autistic, might, some autistic people might be more likely to have C-sections, which would then sort of inform whether or not their child is likely to be autistic because they're autistic too. So the two things, there, there, there may be some correlations there, but that's not causations at all in any way, shape or form. Absolutely. But in 2020, we had people with seeing COVID in 5G as well, didn't we? Yeah, I know. I think that they kind of got blamed for anything and everything at the time, didn't they? COVID and 5G yeah. kind of caused everything. And so, yeah, again, you know, that that was given as a, a cause for, for autism, but absolutely not. I mean, you know, people were autistic long before COVID, you know, long, long before we had all of our lockdowns and everything long before 5g was a thing there's there's really no connection there at all <laughs> no but i think when people don't know an awful lot about autism or if they're conflating autism with other things whenever they're trying to sort of pinpoint a reason why they will literally look for anything that's out there and whatever they can which is really understandable we get that a lot and a lot of autistic people always need to know the reason why as well don't we I mean, if I don't know the reason why something has to be done or why something's happened, I can sometimes find that quite difficult. But we know that largely it's, it's hereditary. So that's where a lot of that comes from. But why people are autistic is not the only myth that we have out there. We have some other fun common myths, don't we? Yeah, yeah, we've got some some good ones here as well. You might have heard of some of these um, <clears throat> when you're out and about. So, you know, things like, oh, well, everyone's a little bit autistic um and I think that this is often said well-meaning I think that people are trying to find common ground you know they're trying to find kind of empathy there by by saying that but actually it's it's really quite invalidating and it's just not accurate because yeah you know sometimes um the ways that as, as autistic people the the ways that we might react to certain things the ways we might kind of speak or, or behave will be very similar to others because we're all human beings actually and and so-called you know autistic traits are often human traits so yeah we're gonna have a lot of common ground but just like for instance you can't be a little bit pregnant you know loads of pregnancy symptoms that people might get for a whole variety of reasons you know you might have swollen ankles one day but you wouldn't say well yeah I've got swollen ankles so I think I'm a little bit pregnant or well I've got a real craving at the moment for macaroni cheese so you know I'm a little bit pregnant well no you're you're either pregnant or you're not you know and and having those are the things that some pregnant people get doesn't mean that you're just a little bit pregnant and it's it's very similar with autism either we have those autistically structured brains or we don't we're either autistic or we're not you can't be a little bit autistic yeah and those differences you know like in, in order to be affected and, and, and um, identified as being autistic you have to show that you know you you communicate in a significantly different way that you 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 um sort of have a different way of interacting with the rest of the world that's significant enough for you to be considered a perspective. It's not you're a little bit or you're you're not at all, is it? No. Um, as I said, autism is not a learning disability either. And we do sometimes see when maybe people are sort of sharing their job application forms for other organizations with us, do you have a learning disability such as autism? And it is not a learning disability by but by, by itself. Some autistic people do have a learning disability. Nothing wrong with having a learning disability, but autism is not a learning disability. No. It's also not just a series of deficits. And, you know, I think this comes a a around for the fact that the assessment process often 
is very deficit based and historically the focus has often been on kind of deficits you know on where we may be our late meeting milestones um on where we might struggle on on areas of our lives where where we might be you know really having a hard time um but actually being autistic just means having that that different brain and you know sometimes that might mean that yeah maybe we'll have a meltdown or something but it also means we experience autistic joy you know yeah we, we might kind of um uh have distress caused by certain sensory input but we also can have sensory bliss and the sensory input that we absolutely love you know it's um it autism's not it's not a good thing it's not a bad thing it just is and it certainly isn't just a load of a big long list of bad things that are somehow wrong with us we're not broken neurotypical people and i think you know sometimes people still refer to the triads of impairments to describe autism and they talk about us having you know social deficits and things but again if you check out our communication webinar that we did with sophia last month you'll see that the way that autistic people communicate is really valid. It's very beautiful culture that we have with that just different. And a lot of non-autistic people can struggle to understand us right back again. So it is a two-way street. And so we shouldn't be blaming autistic people for any kind of misunderstandings between us because, you know, we're all human beings who need to learn how to connect together. Um Autism can and should be cured is another sort of falsehood that's out there. I mean, given that it's about the structure of our brain, we would literally need brain surgery, which would completely change who we are and massively like change our trajectory in life in a way that would just be completely unrecognizable, wouldn't it? So I, I, they absolutely cannot. And, and I think whenever we've had a look at some of the large sort of studies that people out there, that the large questionnaires that folks have put out, most autistic people report that they don't want to be cured and they wouldn't take a cure if one was out there. That brilliant um, piece by Chris Bonello, um, uh, was it last year? Um, uh, yeah, it just showed that autistic people um, rejected, uh, most autistic people rejected that notion that they needed to be cured or that they would take a cure, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and autism also is not a mental health condition, you know, again, on forms and things where you, you, it might be lumped as, as a learning disability. Quite often it's also sort of put in as a as a mental health condition, but it isn't. It really isn't. Now, it, it is accurate to say that um, autistic people are more likely to have a mental health condition like anxiety or, or depression, but that's very much because of the the way the world that we're in isn't actually built for us you know it's very much because of the lived experience that we have kind of living in a world that actually can can end up being quite distressing in in a number of different ways it can be very anxiety inducing due to you know our sensory needs not being met our communication needs not not being met things like that but autism itself is not inherently um, a mental health condition and being autistic does not automatically mean that you're going to have a mental health condition either. Mm. Um, autistic people do have empathy. Um, a lot of things people talk about autistic people can have people lacking empathy and, and, and not being able to show empathy. Autistic people very often show empathy in a completely different manner. Um, so we might show empathy by sort of wanting to share our special interests with somebody else. That's, you know, one of the ways that we love to connect. And so we talk about that being part of autistic love language. And a lot of autistic people really want to do that very compassionate, let, let's solve this problem together kind of empathy. We heard this lovely story um, about an autistic woman whose husband came home having been made redundant. And instead of sitting on the couch and saying, there, there, I'll get you a cup of tea, which would have been very empathetic as well. And and and, and what a lot of people really do need and, and, and get a lot of validation from. She disappeared off upstairs for two hours. And he was downstairs saying, what is this going on? Why, why is she upstairs? But she came downstairs with an updated CV and lots of job opportunities for him to apply to, which we would argue is, is highly empathetic. It's it's recognizing your your partner was in deep distress and going and doing something very practical about it. Um, now it may have been an idea to share that that's what she was doing. That possibly could have been a little bit helpful, but it was also really good that she had a partner who was understanding and that uh, and that and that really 
was very grateful for for the the work that she put in to, to help him to find another job as well. So we do have empathy, but we very often express it in a way that doesn't always get interpreted as being empathetic by some non autistic people. Yeah, we also do that. Yeah, we do that sharing personal stories to empathize thing as well, don't we? You know, loads of ways that we show it, but just not the ways that maybe non-autistic people would. And so it's not recognized that way. Um, but yeah, there's also that myth that autistic people can't play, which is a load of nonsense. We we absolutely can play. Now our play might look different to other people. So, you know, some of those, the the cliches might be, you know, that for instance, autistic kids, rather than driving a car along the ground, going broom, broom, might kind of sit there and spin the wheels to sort of watch that motion um, and and get really caught up with some of the the sensory aspect of that, which is absolutely valid play, you know, Um, rather than kind of playing with our our figures, um, which a lot of autistic kids do as well, by the way. But what we might do is we might line up, you know, in size order, those those figures instead, which is still play, actually. And and it's absolutely fine. So, yeah, we definitely can play. And, you know, even as autistic adults, we we can play. We can play video games and board games and all sorts of different things. What we might do is we might do kind of like what's called parallel play um, as autistic people. So, you know, sometimes it might be that we'll play in the same space as somebody else but we're playing two separate things you know maybe one person is playing a video game and the other person is reading a book or something um and we can kind of chat together um as and when but we're maybe not doing the same thing but we can also play cooperatively as well and and it's a very yeah. individual thing a lot of the time absolutely i mean authentic play is different but it, it can be really beautiful as well and that sort of goes along with, you know, autistic people do have imagination. Many autistic people have got really vibrant imaginations. And when you think about the number of autistic people who um, will uh, write beautiful portraits, who write novels, who paint stunning pictures, there are many, many just wonderful autistic artists out there um musicians and we thoroughly recommend if you're not already following um creative autistics on social media or you know sort of checking out their work in galleries please go and do that because the way that many of them view the world is just absolutely stunning many of my favorite artists are ones who are autistic and my my house may be just a little bit full of artwork by autistic people and it brings me enormous joy to know that you know you you can support autistic creative folks um yeah very help busy. yourself look you're very creative <laughs> i try not i don't i don't have as much time for it as i would like sometimes but yeah absolutely um there's also that myth that autistic people can't give eye contact um and and this is quite an interesting one because it certainly is the case for some of us that it can be quite intensely uncomfortable and maybe even painful to give eye contact but many of us um particularly if we've sort of been masking through a lot of our lives do give some eye contact um, it might not be in the same quantities as other people um, it, it might be kind of fleeting it might be that we've developed sort of strategies where we look at someone's eyebrows or their nose or just sort of pass their their face or something instead um, but it can also sometimes be the case that we we don't know how much eye contact to give because we often ask in training and things and we'll say this is a non-rhetorical question <laughs> How long should we be staring into your eyeballs before we look away? And people never, they never know what to answer us. They can never give us an answer. The other question is, which eyeball am I supposed to be looking at? Because you've got two of them and I can't look at them both at the same time. And again, people will laugh and they will not answer you. So, you know, if if other people can't answer these questions for us, how are we supposed to know what the answer is? Um, now, sometimes, uh, potentially as well, due to due to kind of masking and things, we might actually end up giving more eye contact than you would typically expect. Um, and this can be a bit kind of problematic at times, you know, because quite often if somebody's giving a lot of eye contact, that signifies that they're either 
aggressive or they're showing sexual interest so it, it, we can be misinterpreted um you know as to that we're trying to start a fight or we're flirting with people when when we're not um but yeah we, we often can give eye contact whether or not we want to is is a whole different kind of question altogether though <laughs> Yeah, we did see that study as well. Um, the lovely Evelyn Welton from um, Awesome Training popped in uh, a little comment on a recent post that we did on social media about eye contact, saying that there was a study that was done that said if you give too much eye contact, too much prolonged eye contact, that it can cause hallucinations. So that's me sold on not giving eye contact. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy not to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um. Autism ranges from mild to severe. That that is false, and I think we're going to have a look at that in just you know like the next the, the next slide or two. But autistic people are antisocial. Is another one of those myths that are out there. There are some non-autistic people who are antisocial and don't want to um socialize with other folks. Um, and there are some autistic people who don't really like to socialize. But most of the autistic people that we support get in touch with us because they are seeking connections with other people. Yeah. Aren't they? And you and I literally met at a social group for autistics. So. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think that that can definitely dispel that myth. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we've seen that we often get asked about, you know, whether we run any groups for autistic people, um, because a lot of our service users are really looking to socialize, actually. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a big myth, isn't it? Absolutely. So there are quite a few of them out there. So hopefully we've busted some. And I'm really looking forward to checking out the comments to see if anybody else has got any other myths that they've been hearing as well. Right. So how do we talk about autism? <laughs> this is another great, great big one. I think the first, the first and most important thing is whenever you're talking to an autistic person, ask them what they want. And really go with them because every, every autistic person has an inalienable right to decide how they want the fact that they're autistic to be referred to. Every single one. And you know, there, there are some studies that show like a preference, but each individual autistic person has the absolute right to decide their identity and how they want their being autistic referred to, don't they, Flick? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, we would always say that if you're dealing with one autistic person, then it's a really good idea to check that with them. Now, you know, if, for instance, you're putting out information um, and you just need to refer, you know, in general to autistic people or, or you're kind of addressing a, a really big group or something, what sort of language should you maybe be using? Well, there have been sort of preferences shown, haven't there, in, in studies that have been done and kind of big questionnaires that have been put out there. So first of all, we'll look at kind of identity first language versus person first language. And for anybody who's kind of like, the what now? What, what do those even mean? Um, identity first language is when you're saying autistic person, you know, autistic uh, children, autistic woman, or autistic people. Person first language is when you're saying person with autism, you know, child with autism, um, a group with autism. Um, and quite often what we find is professionals when they're being trained, you know, whether that's teachers, people working in medical fields, whatever, they're often told to use person first language. Um, and the reason given is, you know, often, well, it, it really helps you to remember that they're a person. <laughs> We would all always kind of say, oh, hang on a minute. If you're really struggling to remember that we're people, don't really want you working with me, actually. Um, that's that's not, not a great thing, is it? Um, and in those kind of big studies, in those big questionnaires, what we have find, found is, well, not not there is no consensus because we're, we're not all kind of clones of each other. But most autistic people do prefer identity first language. So you'll have noticed probably that Marion and I, as we've done this presentation, we've been using that person first language, saying that we are autistic. Identity first language, dear. Ident sorry, identity first language. Oh no, <laughs> can't get that one wrong. Um, we are autistic, we're autistic people. 
we are not people with autism. Um, and, you know, quite often a lot of people will kind of say that autism is not something that we can be with because it's not something we can be without. It's not like a handbag. It's not like an accessory that I can pop over in the corner for a little while if I've decided that I'm going to be without it for the day. Um, you know, and, and also a lot of the time when you're talking about other aspects of your identity, you know, you wouldn't say I wouldn't say that I'm a person with motherhood. I am a mother, you know, um, I wouldn't say that I am a, a a person with Britishness, you know, I am British. Um, so yeah, in, in the same way, we are autistic. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that is the charity stance on that. Um, and, and that is a, a kind of majority view on that one. So we always, always, always go with what other people think. So if somebody says to us in a meeting, I would rather we use first and first language, Totally fine. Absolutely up to them. If they're autistic, they get to make up their own mind, don't they? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Aspie is um, sort of short for Asperger's syndrome. And that was a diagnosis that was given up until about 2013. But around about then, there were lots and lots of different, um, they, they, they would sort of refer to them as types of autism or phenotypes or brands of autism. Um pervasive developmental delay and not otherwise specified, classic autism, canners, autism, childhood schizophrenia, all sorts of things under this big umbrella of autism. But whenever they actually looked at what is the difference between these different groups, it really was difficult to tell why. And I think a lot of human beings like the idea of sort of putting people into neat little boxes, but it doesn't actually work like that. Um, and so uh, the, the decision was made that if you were given an autism diagnosis, then autism was the diagnosis. And Asperger's was removed as a separate diagnosis um, about 10 years or so ago. Some people have uh, decided that they want to keep that as their diagnosis. And again, that's absolutely up to them. But we also did find out some really um, distressing history that's uh, connected to Hans Asperger, who, who um, Asperger's is named after, which has meant that a lot of people who had that diagnosis um, have moved on. And a lot of people these days, we're seeing an increasing number of people say, just referring to themselves as being autistic rather than being, you know, a discrete phenotype, which doesn't really exist because there's so much crossover between them as well. So it's definitely one that's getting used an awful lot less. Um, a neurodivergent. That, uh, yeah, so I, I think the, the neurodiversity paradigm is something that people have been talking about more and more, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, within the autistic community and the wider neurodivergent community, we've been talking about it since the 90s. So it's good to see other people sort of patching up and getting used to it. Neurodiversity is sort of the idea that um, there are lots and lots of different brains in the same way that neuro uh, biodiversity means that there are lots and lots of different kinds of life, which is lovely. Um, it's a really, really nice way of sort of having a look at that and sort of really inclusive and that no type of brain is better than the other. There are some brains which are more, which are considered typical. You know, they tend to be like, you know, the neuro majority, what most brains are like. And people who have brains that differ from that neuro majority are we call neurodivergent because they diverge from that typical. And many autistic people, arguably most autistic people, are multiple neurodivergent, aren't they? So they're not just autistic. They might be autistic and what they, they might be autistic and and autistic and and autistic and something else. Autistic and ADHD, autistic and dyslexic, autistic and something else. Um that's totally cool. So neurodivergent is something that a lot of autistic people will use to describe themselves as well. I like, you know, the term neurospicy. It's kind of cool. You know, some people are sort of using that because when people talked about, you know, mild autism versus spicy autism, that is quite a fun one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And and I think that that's part of that kind of reclaiming of language as well, um, because yeah. a lot of people weren't really keen on on the the whole kind of oh mild autism, um, which is what we'll be sort of moving on to in just a moment. So when we're thinking yeah. about on the spectrum, we do have a, a beautiful um, kind of graphic to show you in, in just a moment. Um, but yeah, some some autistic people like the idea of, of saying they're on the spectrum. Um, a lot of autistic people find it a bit 
problematic for, for various reasons. Um, one of those reasons being, you know, they might ask, well, which spectrum are you talking about? <laughs> you, you're talking about, you know, um, my, my sexuality. Are you talking about uh, gender identity? There are lots of different spectrums in, in humanity. So just saying on the spectrum um, isn't very clear. Um, it, it might also be the case that when people talk about the spectrum, they misunderstand what that means, which we'll, we'll get onto in that we'll next, next slide. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for, for some people, it can it can be a bit tricky. Um, and also it's, it's very much similar when it comes to kind of high and, and low functioning as well. Um, mm. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, yeah, this sort of um, this idea that you're either really 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 autistic or potentially that you are and you know it, it's not a term that we do like to use low functioning um or that you're oh just just mildly autistic or you're you're high functioning um and it's been very problematic using those terms for a long time because it, it can mean that you're denied support um on uh on the one hand, if you say, you know, if people refer to you as being high functioning, but it can also mean that you're denied agency as well, if, if people think that you're so-called low functioning. But yeah, I think that the next slide will, will go on to really kind of demonstrate that so I can go into it in a bit more depth. I love this slide. And, you know, I think this is just a lovely, beautiful picture, but the slide after this, we're going to sort of really have, have a chat about it. But, you know, Autism happy place is just genuinely sort of like a, a, a happy place. But LilPenguinStudios.com is a beautiful website for, for people to go and explore some lovely autistic created um, artworks that really sort of very much illustrate the reality of what it's like to be autistic as well. And people tend to think of the, the spectrum as being like a line, that it's linear, that there you've got really... Um, not very autistic on one end and very autistic on the other um but the reality is that if you are autistic you're autistic um and that your expression of being autistic is really 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 dynamic so i love this beautiful color wheel here where it's looking at you know the different ex expressions of your being and how very changeable some of those can be right now my communication is you know, it's 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 quite good. I'm I'm able to communicate using mouth speak quite quite fluently. Later on tonight, I may experience situational mutism because I've had a really busy week. So you know, um, that I, I might be a little bit harder um later on tonight, but that's totally cool. There's ways that we can manage that. My executive functioning, whenever it comes to work, is usually pretty good, but when it comes to home. I'm very glad I've got really good support structure at home that helps me with these sorts of things and sensitivities as well. I mean, like I know that there's some mornings you'll wake up and there's some clothes that you can wear no problem and then other bits of clothing that you might really struggle to wear and that can change throughout the day, can't it? Oh, absolutely. There are times when, yeah, I, I get to a point in the day and I'm like, I'm going to need to change because actually this top mm -hmm. is not meeting my sensory needs anymore. Maybe the neckline is suddenly too high or, or too low or it's too tight yeah. or too loose. And yeah, absolutely. So it's it's very fluid. It's, it's very yeah. dynamic in that way. I'll let you talk about this one. Yeah. It's, it's such an important thing to understand that the spectrum is not just linear, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we really wanted to go into depth with this because this is one that we, we do get asked about an awful lot. Um, so, yeah, being autistic can influence our skills in in many ways and, and for different people as well. So, you know, for one person, that might mean that they are highly skill skilled in one area, um, but it might mean that actually they really they sort of need a lot more support in, the, in another area. Um, you know, you can have um, somebody who has a, a, an advanced degree in something, but at the same time, they maybe are not actually able to sort of cook their own meals um, for maybe executive functioning reasons. Um, and, and that can make it really difficult then to figure out like, OK, so if, if that there was that that linear line, where where would they be on the spectrum? Would they be high functioning at that point? Would they be low functioning? Would they be mildly autistic? You know, it it sort of doesn't really kind of make an awful lot of sense. Um, and a lot of the time when what people think of um, as kind of uh, being being low functioning autistic, it often means that you're autistic plus. It often means that actually um, you you kind of uh, have 
you're autistic, but that you maybe have other stuff going on as well. You've got co-occurring things going on. Um, and, and that's what kind of really makes it makes it different um, for you and, and might mean that you have those higher support needs as well. But what we need can fluctuate hourly, day, daily, weekly, yearly. You know, like Marion said, there are days when I will wake up in the morning um, and I can wear one certain top, but then the next day I really can't. Um, so it very much does vary. And one, a lot of the things that play into that are things like stress, you know, how stressed we are can very much change and, and, and affect our sensory needs, our executive functioning needs, our communication needs, whether we're hungry, whether we're really tired or fatigued, you know, whether we've got hormonal changes going on, because that can massively impact us as well. Um, the environment around us and whether that's meeting our needs and just so many different factors. Um, and it really is important to remember that our needs are not fixed, actually. Um, and so supports need to be quite flexible. Mm -hmm. You know, something that we'll need one day is not necessarily going to be the same as what what we need the next day. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I would say that, you know, certainly when I'm thinking about my own lived experience, things like pregnancy and menopause have had a huge influence on my expression of being autistic as well. You know, my sensory profile, my ability to do, you know, to do the executive functioning. Um, and like a lot of uh, other autistic people, I have um, fibromyalgia. Uh, which is quite common within our community. So a lot of us talk about fibro fog in the brain plus menopause fog plus one of those days where your 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 executive functioning is just out the window. Yeah, all of these things can have an influence because it's all intersectional, isn't it? Because you're not just somebody who's autistic. You're autistic with all of these other identities that are going on too. Yeah. And I think quite often a lot of stuff just gets lumped in, doesn't it? As, oh, well, you know, if you're autistic, oh, well, then anything you've got going on must be because you're autistic. And it's like, well, actually, other people might also have similar things going on as well. Um, you know, us being autistic, is, it's not the only thing that we have going on in our life at all. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, our needs are not fixed at all. So supports need to be flexible. And kind of like, as we said um, earlier on in, in the webinar, because we have, you know, such a, a dynamic skill set, the support needs that we have one day, one hour may not match the the, the, the support needs that we've got the next day. Uh, you know, part of, um, I, I think it's the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, really recognizes that evolving capacities for disabled people, because we're not just sort of static. You can't say, right, well, this is what you're like on the day you were assessed and identified as being autistic so this is what you're going to be like for the rest of your life absolutely not like every other human being we can grow we can develop we can need more support the next day um just like everyone else right absolutely um so what do you think so oh some of these words get sort of used whenever we're talking about autism quite frequently is autism a difference, a disorder, a condition, a neurotype, a disability? I mean, a lot of autistic people are really comfortable with the notion that uh, being autistic is is a different kind of neurotype. Um, so it's it's just a different expression of a brain and the way that the brain works. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, we we showed those those kind of brain scans side by side. We we literally are different, and different doesn't mean bad, you know. Um. So yeah, saying that that it's being autistic is a difference, you know that that is pretty accurate. Um. Not all autistic people are going to be comfortable with that because you know, like we've said, we're we're all very different. But um, <laughs> play on words there. Um, but but a lot of us, a lot of us will, are are fine with saying that. Yeah, yeah, being autistic is a difference. Um, but what about disorder? How do you feel about that one, Marion? <laughs> um, I think like an awful lot of other autistic people. Um, I I feel uh, I, I and as an organisation, we feel quite uncomfortable with the term disorder to describe autistic people because disorder kind of. Has, has these connotations that there's something medically wrong with you, which we would dispute. And I think the same goes for um, the term condition as well. I think a lot of clinicians are now making a big deal about autism not being a disorder, which is great. 
but some of them will use the term condition as they see it as being less medicalizing, but it is still medicalizing. Um, and it's, yes, we do have these, you know, the, the, the difference in the structure, but that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with that condition, sort of makes you think, well, that's something to be treated, which is not, I mean, you can't, you can't treat the fact that somebody's autistic. They may benefit from something like speech and language therapy or occupational therapy, if they've got a good neurodivergent affirming occupational therapist or speech and language therapist, that can be really handy. But there's nothing inherently wrong in being autistic. So so terms like disorder and condition don't really fit in with the way that a lot of autistic people view themselves and their needs, do they? No, no, they're, they're very, very medicalizing. Um, and, and that can make us feel very uncomfortable. Um, but neurotype, on the other hand, like you said, you know, that that's fair enough. A lot a lot of autistic people don't mind, you know, that that as a term because it it is, you know, we, we literally do have that difference in the brain. Um, so being autistic does mean that we have a, a different neurotype to to the, the neuromajority. Um but then How about dis and disability. <laughs> so this is a huge one, isn't it? Because I, I think that this can be controversial for um, you know non-autistic people to talk about, but even within the autistic community, you know, not everybody is in agreement here. Um, but yeah, when it comes to disability, um, it's not actually a bad word. There is nothing wrong with having a disability at all, is there? Um, and when it when at the charity, we do we recognise autism as a disability, um, and and under UK law, it is classed as a disability as well. But we have a lot more, don't we, to kind of deep dive into with with that one to sort of look at it a bit a bit further. Yeah. Um, we are a disabled persons organisation, so we are an autistic persons organisation because we are run by autistic people. Um, for autistic people and for you know the wider community who wants to learn about autism but you know a disabled persons organization is run by disabled people um, and that's what autism understanding Scotland is so we are actually quite comfortable with the term disability um, and like a lot of autistic people we do talk about the social model of disability um, quite often the, so uh, the social model of disability supposes that society is the thing that is problematic not the disabled person. The disabled person is fine. Disability is a natural variation in, you know, um, in, in the human race. Um, and that society um, putting up barriers to autistic people and otherwise disabled people is the problem, not the disabled people themselves. And that society widely is responsible for inclusion. So society has to make adjustments in order to make it accessible for autistic and otherwise disabled people. So when people think about making things accessible, like they often think about what wheelchair ramps, yeah, um, the hearing loops for disabled for, for um uh, the deaf community, yeah, but, but it can also be other things as well, can't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, it, it might be sort of thinking about people's sensory needs, actually, um, and, and really kind of putting into place things to support those. It, it might be to do with communication differences and actually putting into place things to, to support those as well. So there are lots of different ways um, in which people can really kind of help with that that inclusion um and it is important to note that all human beings have inherent worth and that's where you know the, the that social model of, of disability really kind of emphasizes that as a human being you know you are actually valuable um and that it's not based on what you can achieve on how much money you can make you know it's it's not based your weight, on your yeah looks. Yeah. anything like that is just that yeah each person because they're a person you know because they're a human they they have that inherent worth um and yeah like much like the 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 ways that we can be inclusive in all kinds of ways um those barriers can also look very different you know sometimes a barrier can be environmental sometimes a barrier can be to do with the the ethos of of a society of an organization of, of a company sometimes it, it can be social so yeah barriers can come in, in all sorts of different forms um and society is responsible for actually really kind of breaking down those barriers for for people who who are stopped kind of living their lives because of them um, um 
and we really wanted to emphasize that autistic people have a right to access work education and wider society um, and, and we will be kind of looking a bit more on, on a little bit of that that legislation as well that we have mm -hmm. in the UK yeah um, and that really is I mean I think that's one of the issues that a lot of autistic people have whenever they find out that they're autistic or whether they're exploring that they're autistic because they don't always recognize that yes it is an actual right isn't it um, it's not just something that would be quite nice to have it, there you do have protections under UK and international legislation whenever it comes to reasonable adjustments. Um, and we do have an entire section on our website um, uh, looking at what reasonable adjustments are and what sort of things might be considered a reasonable adjustment in sort of different contexts for different people. Reasonable adjustments always have to be based on need rather than diagnosis. So you don't need to have a, a formal identification or a diagnosis of autism in order to access reasonable adjustment. You just need to show that there is an actual need for these things to be in there as well. But the, the legislation that we have in the UK, we have the um, the Equality Act 2010. Um, there's also acts that are related to, to, to education, um, but there's also the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child also references um, supporting disabled children as well. So there's quite a few different bits of legislation. And again, we do have a section on our website that looks at autistic rights, what they are, and you know, different ways to ensure that your rights are being upheld. Yeah, absolutely. So, but there mm -hmm. are other there are other benefits, aren't there, of uh, to identifying as being disabled? Because we know that not all autistic people are always comfortable identifying as being disabled. But actually, you know, it does come with some some benefits, including actual benefits. Um, so, you know, we we know that this is going out to lots of people around the world. So this will definitely vary um, from from country to country. But here in Scotland, we have um, adult disability payments. So, you know, that's something that, that you can always apply for um, and, and see if you're, you, you, you meet all the criteria for that if you're autistic. Um, on our own website, we have our AU Scott Autism Information Card as well, um, which initially was one that was developed during COVID as a, as a COVID card, but we've, we've since kind of uh, rejigged it to be a, a general information card. And that gives you a lot of space to just kind of fill in yourself any information that you feel other people might need to know, um, you know, perhaps because you um, experience situational mutism and then there might be times when you, you want to kind of hand that over to people. There might be various scenarios where you feel like having an information card could be could be quite useful. So that's that's downloadable on our website. And we definitely called it an information card rather than an alert card because you don't need to be alerted to the fact that we're autistic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and we did create it in collaboration with NHS Grampian, so it has got the NHS Grampian logo on it as well as the AU Scott logo too. Um, but you have a sunflower lanyard, don't you, Flip? I do. do you yeah. Use on occasion. I, I yeah, I don't always use it, but I sometimes do. So that was one that was developed by airports um, to to signify that somebody had a hidden disability. Um, and it's also now used in in UK supermarkets as well. If you want one, you can sort of go up to the the information desk in somewhere like Tesco or or Sainsbury's, and they'll give you one. Um, and yeah, it's it's there to sort of um, signify to other people that you or somebody that you're with uh, has a, a hidden disability. Um, now, not everybody likes them because some a lot of people sort of feel that they shouldn't have to advertise that fact that that they do have a hidden disability. But some people do really kind of feel comfort from wearing that um, and, and knowing that other people might know to, you know, just give them a bit more space um, or perhaps a bit more patient. Yeah, yeah, um, a bit more processing time, things like this. So um, now during COVID, unfortunately, some people did start wearing it um, because they didn't want to wear masks. Now, lots of people with various disabilities were exempt for, for good reasons from, from wearing masks. Um, and so sometimes they would also be, you know, wearing the, the sunflower lanyard. Some people who who just simply didn't want to wear one with without any real good reason decided to wear the sunflower lanyard as, as a kind of, you know some sort of excuse and at that point it did become a little bit stigmatized um because then you know some people sort of thought if you were wearing a sunflower lanyard that meant you were a, a covid denier or, or something like that so there was a bit of 
politicizing of it unfortunately during that time which I think has calmed down a lot now but it is something that is just worth being aware of um because yeah wouldn't you wouldn't want to be kind of caught unawares with that one no no and I think that's a good sort of thing to be aware of but um there is also the CEA card um which we you know a lot of people aren't aware of if you're in receipt of something like child disability payment or your child is in receipt of it um if you receive the, the adult disability payment or fifth and, and um then you can apply for a CEA card if you're over the age of eight um and you go onto line to the CEA website you upload uh proof that you're in receipt of a benefit so you know just photograph of your your award letter or, or or something like that um a photograph of the person who received it so either yourself or or, or the child um and it costs about six pounds and then what they do usually within about a week or so they'll send you out a cea card which means that you get into you pay for your own ticket to the cinema but you get to bring someone else along with you for free um so most people by the time you've used the cinema card twice you've got your money back so um and it's really cheap and really easy and even my executive functioning skills at home were was able to manage organizing that one which really is saying something i think um but it's it's a small i got you i was able to get it organized within i think five ten minutes at most so it really is a, one of those very very quick easy things that you can get that can save you a significant amount of money if you are as much a fan of going to the cinema as I am. So definitely worth um, uh, investing in. Access to work, I think we've sort of covered the reasonable adjustments in the protection under law. Um, access to work is a, is, is a scheme where if you are disabled in anywhere at all, and um, as we've said, autism is a protected characteristic under the law as a disability, then you can get a free work means place assessment um, and they will make recommendations to your employer as to what it is that you need in order to help you do your best at, uh, at work and sort of level the playing field between you and your colleagues. Um, and the earlier you apply, the um, uh, then it means that you're more likely to be able to get that support for free. If you work in a really small organization, you will get all of that support for free. But for larger organizations, then the organization might have to pay a little bit of money first and then they will co cover the rest. And we've seen some really amazing things come out of the access to work. So it can take a little while to get it, but it can take, uh, but, but once you do get it, you can get some amazing support. And you can also get an um, NEC card for um, bus travel um, in, our, in our area as well. So there's lots of different reasons why identifying as disabled can actually be beneficial to you. You know, financially, socially, um, uh, in, in education, in work. So it's not, you know, it's not a dirty word. It's not a bad word. It's, it's, it's one of those things that I think is slowly being destigmatized. But I, the wider disability community is working really hard to do that, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we've not got much left. Um, so we think, so we have, I, I've, I've been talking about a lot of people say, well, how do we treat autistic people then? Because uh, they get really worried because they want you. people want to be kind, people want to be thoughtful, uh, but so often people will try and sort of make decisions for us without including us. And that's why we're saying, you know, that this isn't a be all and end all on how to treat autistic people, far from it, because the main thing is ask that autistic person, what, how did they want to be treated? What kind of supports do they need? but always presume competence. Um, and I think especially with a lot of non-speaking autistic people, with a lot of autistic people who have a learning disability, there's this idea that they are less competent at making decisions for themselves when there isn't necessarily any evidence to suggest that it's the case. Um, so always presume that they can hear you, that they are processing what you are saying and that they are capable of feeding into decisions about themselves. That's good to say flip. Yeah, absolutely. But you definitely can make reasonable adjustments. Now, like Marion said, you should be checking in with the individual as to what reasonable adjustments would actually benefit them. Because we, we have had cases where, you know, schools or employers have kind of decided themselves what reasonable adjustments they're going to put in place, maybe gone and bought a fancy sensory tent or something. And then, you know, the, the, the kids never used it <laughs> because that wasn't what they needed in the first place. So do actually check what reasonable adjustments 
are going to be needed um, and, and do have that conversation. But when we do tell you what our needs are, then actually put those things into place, you know, put it into practice mm -hmm. as well. That's that's really important. So important that we're listened to and our lived experiences are believed because we do very often see a lot of autistic people get gaslit. You know, whenever we say that's too scratchy. Oh, no, it's not. Everybody else is coping with that. That's too noisy. Nobody else is complaining about the noise. Just, you know, crack on with it. So it's really important that you listen and believe and then make reasonable adjustments based on what we're reporting. And giving us choice and control really, really does help. I mean, a lot of people get distressed um, whenever they don't feel like they have any agency over their lives and over what's happening to them. So making sure that if you've got an autistic person in your life, that you are giving them plenty of choice and control over their life and, and helping them to, you know, develop their independence if they um, if, if if that's something that they're looking to do, you know, and, and giving them the support in the way that they're wanting to get support. But, if, you know, I think for a lot of us who are autistic, particularly those of us who've got like a demand avoidant profile, if somebody's consistently making those choices for us and not allowing us control over these things, that really is very distressing, especially whenever you couple that with miscommunication and gaslighting, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So listen believe us make these reasonable adjustments and allow us to have choice and control over what's going on i think we've just got a couple of slides left but i mean i think this how autism is portrayed in the media beth wilson did, did a beautiful job um in, in in creating this slide it's very often the little professor yeah this yeah boy. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, the sort of uh, autistic boy rocking in the corner or it's that kind of, you know, highly, highly kind of qualified, um, but but socially awkward autistic man. You know, it's it's, it's really kind of narrow presentations of what it's like to be autistic. Um, but yeah, actually, anyone could be autistic. <laughs> the, the, any age. Yeah, any yeah. age any any ethnic background you know any gender um anybody could be autistic at all yeah. um so there there really isn't just one or two presentations of, of being autistic there's many different presentations as there are autistic people and again that's really a, a beautiful recognition of, of of our uniqueness um and we love finishing up with some some autistic strengths as well because you know, that the, the, a lot of what we talk about whenever we're thinking about um, uh, the autistic community and when we're going through the assessment process, so much of it is focused on the difficulties that we have. And we're absolutely not trying to gloss over the difficulties that autistic people face. I mean, we know as well as anybody else, because we are autistic ourselves, we experience those difficulties too, but it's not the full story. And tonight is just a wee introduction to autism. So it's really important that we do point out that there are other parts of being autistic that are really just wonderful, and some of which we've kind of talked about today. I love the autistic sense of humor. It's so dark sometimes, the <laughs> autistic sense of humor. Um, and that, to me, is just joyful. And there's so much wordplay that can go on with that as well. Um, Finn, do you want to start? Are you sort of focused on? Yeah, do you want to explain Finn? Yeah. <laughs> mentioned it yeah yeah spins spins that would be short for special interests so sp in, uh special interest and and we did kind of have a little look at that earlier um i think it's really clear to see behind me that one of my special interests there is you know uh corvids so that's the the bird family with rooks and and crows and ravens and things in and yeah having those special interests can really bring a lot of joy to our lives it can really help us in a, in a whole variety of way but yeah, we, we often love talking about our special interests, don't we? <laughs> and I think your show is that so many autistic people do have that deep connection with animals as well and sort of nature generally. I know that human beings can be quite connected to animals and to nature, but I think a lot of autistic people just gain that extra support, that extra connection with them. Um, and I think a lot of autistic people are just some of the most determined, tenacious individuals that I have ever met. And I and I so respect that. Um, and, you know, whenever we have that uh, that notion that something has gone on, that there's been an injustice going on, we can just be so determined at trying our best to see, see that put right. 
Um, and I think that really does link into that autistic empathy as well, doesn't it, Flick? Absolutely, it really does. But yeah, lovely, lovely slide, I think, to finish on, isn't it? <laughs> but in true teacher fashion, you know, we've got some last key takeaways um, for you. Being autistic means having a differently structured brain. Um, and there are lots of different ways in which that could be presenting because a lot of autistic people aren't just autistic. That's not just their only um, uh, neurodivergence. There might be other neurodivergencies that are sort of um, influencing how that brain is structured too. Autism is thought to be hereditary. So it's very fair to be considering, you know, if your child gets assessed um, as autistic, if you get assessed as autistic, that you might want to consider who else in the family might be autistic as well. Really important that you ask autistic people their language preferences and how they should be best supported as well. I mean, we've all got our own preferences whenever it comes to this sort of thing. And however an autistic person was be referred to is absolutely fine. They have that inalienable right. So we should never be telling an autistic person how they should or shouldn't be referring to themselves. Disabled people do have additional protections uh, under law and, the, and, and there can be real benefits to identifying as disabled. Um, and even if the only way that you identify as being disabled is, you know, you know through, through accessing the benefit system, that can be really, really useful to you and to your wider family and sort of helping you out. And we have strengths because we're autistic, not despite being autistic. And these beautiful autistic strengths are just as much a part of our lived experience as any other aspect. So they're just as much a part of being autistic as it's, um, uh, meltdowns, as elopements, sensory bliss is, is, is as important as um, sensory distress. Um, so really important to recognize that autism is not just a list of deficits. It's much, much, much more than that. And, and then we would argue that autistic people aren't deficit at all. These are differences that need to be nurtured supported um, uh, and really valued for, for, for the variety that it brings to the world. Would you add anything to that, Flick? No, I think that that's absolutely everything and, and well done. But yeah, we just wanted to say a big thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for your attention tonight. Thank you for, you know, whether you're watching this um, after the fact or whether you're here with us live, big, big thank you to you all. I think we'll stop recording now so we can go and have a chat with those people who've turned up live. Um, so thank you for joining us there. And